Good morning, Bitcoin. My name is Thomas Hunt, and this is Proof of Work. Proof of Work is a show about the people behind Bitcoin, what they do, and how they got here. Our guest today is Travis Urig. Travis, how's it going? Thanks, Tom. I, I feel a little underdressed. Oh, well, it's just uh, I keep this hanging up. I wear it all the time. <laughs> it's going really good. How are you? Oh, it's been good. It's sunny and warm in Sacramento. Took the dog for a walk. Everything is good. So let's go ahead and get down to everyone's most favorite and familiar question. Travis, what was your first computer? Oh, gosh. Uh, I thought a little about this. Um, I realized my, my initial answer was incorrect. Uh, I thought it was a computer I got in later, but I suppose the first computer I spent a lot of time with and was exposed to was in elementary school. Uh, a new library opened up while I was there. They had been working on it for a while, and I was very lucky to been in the year that the, the library opened up, and there was a computer area. And I guess I was allowed to go in there during recess or something. I'm not sure exactly the details. I do know, I remember it was unsupervised computer time other than the librarian was there. It wasn't like a part of a class or something. And there was a game on it that I think was called Museum Madness, but I've tried to find the game and I haven't quite found it. Um, I think maybe I, I got the name slightly wrong. And every time I would play the game, I always had to start over. Uh, you couldn't save your progress. So I would essentially just like speed run the first, you know, bit I get. I learned the first puzzles, a series of puzzles, the way the game works. You're, you're slowly exploring a museum uh, and solving puzzles with different exhibits along the way. And and I you have to like first you have to get into the museum, then you have to like get past like this reception area. And I would just sort of speed run each of those segments until I got to a new puzzle I didn't know. And I try to figure it out. And once I figured it out, then I'd speed run it the next time. And I have to keep starting over every time. So the computer taught you patience and frustration right away. That's right. It also, I, I had a very early speed run career, but unfortunately Twitch wasn't around. Oh, what kind of computer was it? Was it a PC or an Apple computer? It was a desktop. I'm pretty sure it was a PC. I mean, that, they were all desktops. And uh, what did you do with the computer after that? Did you work on graphics programs or did you play more games? Yeah, that particular computer, I think the only thing I ever did was play Museum Madness. Um, later on in, in middle school or very early high school, um, we got our own computers. We got a desktop and me and my sister got a laptop. Um, and I remember when we got those, because we went to this, it was like a custom build. We went to a computer store. It wasn't like off of a, it wasn't, oh, just get the new Apple or whatever. It was some custom thing. I think it was like a, a gateway or an Acer or something like that. And I had to go to the computer store. And there was a salesman, it was like they're going to a car dealership. And um, they talked about all the different features and they got to, you know, you need the, the RAM undercoating insurance. And uh, my parents didn't know what that stuff was. And so essentially I just bought the computers. I interacted with the salesman and I said, we don't need that, we need this. And um, there was, it's, it's a story they like to tell because it's the time they're, you know, 13 year old kid or whatever a 12 year old kid was in charge of a significant, you know, bit of fi family financial decision-making. Uh, they just kind of had to let me do it. <laughs> well, and, and we were the ones that had the knowledge then. Mm -hmm. We knew the difference between yeah. a hard drive and a RAM. And uh, that was incontrovertible. That was good knowledge, good information. And you yeah. were probably able to help out your family there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and me and my sister had the same laptop and then there was a desktop. And um, that was sort of the first time I had a computer of my own. Uh, and I think to answer your question, like what I used it for, it was really IRC was probably the main thing I used it for. Good old internet relay chat, the command line running on Unix servers, uh, you know, 1980s era communication technology that was still alive and kicking, still is alive and kicking. People still run IRC servers to this day. And just what, hanging out my IRC of, communities. What kind of chat rooms did you hang out in? Was it like Star Trek or computer programming or music? Uh, yeah, there was, there was like communities around just in computer interest. So some of them were around uh, like, uh, you know, uh, there were programming communities, but, you know, early stuff. I, I wasn't really that into programming at the time. It was more like just, you know, web, web stuff, you know, HTML, CSS. 
and there was a, photo, a flash player, oh, there was Macromedia Flash before it was Adobe Flash. And Macromedia Flash was just like the coolest thing ever. You know, you had this full like interactive animation suite. It was like, there was a scripting language inside of it that you could use. Um, I remember I found a, a bug in the scripting language that would just like spawn infinite new Macromedia windows. Um, and like writing up like how to do it and then teaching other people how to do it. Um, it was just kind of just really just goofing off with whatever tools were available at the time. It was the wild, wild west back then. We had a great uh, mm -hmm. error on Windows once where if you sent a message to a certain port number, it would blue screen of death the computer. And uh, oh, nice. over on the, the Macintosh side of the computer lab, and uh, we have we learned about this. And of course, we had the IP addresses of all the PCs on the other side. Of we course. would just go boop, 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 and shut them down one at a time. And they would curse us from across the lab, and we would laugh at their problem. But at the same time, I had a chart on the wall for how often I made my Mac crash, uh, which <laughs> I was very capable of doing as well, So, but just not in the same way. Yeah, the library in my high school had, there was a Mac area, and then there was a wall of PCs. And the fun thing to do with the Macs was to make them talk because uh, you could do it remotely with like a script. Um, you could like trigger it remotely over the network. So we have them like talk to each other. Uh, and then the PCs, uh, they're a little, you know, remote control. Oh, they're, they're called rats, remote administration tools. These little rat tools that you can get off of like, you know, uh, wares sites and, you know, just like just bullshit internet stuff. And all of the computers were just horribly infected with the stuff because there were no controls or restrictions or monitoring software or any of these things. So you just sit there and just mess with them um, and be able to, you know, do essentially do whatever you wanted to them from the other, from the, from the Macs, we control the PCs and vice versa. Yeah, it's the same thing as well. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned remote administration. One of the first uh, remote administration tools was back orifice. And uh, yes, I didn't say office, I said <laughs> orifice, because it was released yeah. by CDC, the Cult of the Dead Cow, uh, in uh, Las Vegas at DEF CON, and uh, I was there. Oh, wow. And then they released oh, wow. uh, BO2K the next year. And it was just so excited to get home, install this on one of your other computers, and then control the computer remotely. And you're moving the mouse yeah. around, and sure, you know, next you're using it to mess with your friend. You're like, hey, install this program. Uh, what's your IP? And then you're controlling their computer through the network. Yeah. It's pretty cool. But then now, years later, uh, I do this all the time for work, right? I'm controlling yeah. a server and I've got a program and I'm controlling another server and I've got a program. And I think I'm a super elite hacker like I was with BO2K and Back Orifice. Uh, but no, now I'm just a network guy doing administration on you know a variety of machines. Yeah, it, that was the cool thing about it at the time. I think that the public perception of the time was like, well, these are hacking tools. You know, these are viruses. I even said myself, the computers are all infected. Uh, and that native connotation, but it was fun to use for two ways. One, pranking, right? You know, you prank your friends, you try to get something installed on their computer, and it was always like, who can sneak what onto whose computer? Uh, so that was just more like playful back and forth, you know? We weren't trying to like hack into the mainframe and change our grades or something like that. And the other thing was, it was just a powerful technology that we could, you could see like, oh, this is really cool. I can access remote hardware. I can do things at a distance. That's spooky, at, you know, at a distance, and that's just such a huge part of of how that's that's cloud computing, right? I mean, that is that is AWS. That's that's how everything works now. Um, you're not aside from your laptop. Uh, everything every other time somebody uses a computer, like for servers and you know creating websites and building start, you know, making a startup, it's all remotely controlling external resources, and it's just a very powerful, cool tool. And it was just fun to play around with that, which is the kind of the only version was available to us at the time. I also think one of the best ways to learn about computers is to break them, to install yeah. too many programs, to uh, install things you don't know what it's going to do. I mean, yeah. I taught myself like learn the Windows. And, and Windows and uh, Word and stuff like that by clicking on every button. I was like, what does mail merge <laughs> do? I don't know what yeah. it is. Let's see what I'm going to mail merge. You know, here it goes. And uh, sure, another person might have said, no, don't click it. You might break the computer. I was more like, I want to see a mail merge. You know, I want yeah, to see. Yeah, the only way I'm going to learn. Yeah. The only way I'm going to learn what, what is a mail merge. The only way you're going to learn is, is just you just click every button. You have to kind of not be afraid of breaking it because part of that is, well, I've broken it before and I fixed it. And you start getting a confidence, you know, you can fix it. 
if you break it. And worst case scenario, there's always the, the nuclear option of reformatting the whole thing and throwing your copy of Windows, your you know, your copies of Windows 98 or Windows XP into it again and starting over. Uh, and, and the, many, the learning many, through many breaking. Times your, your home folder and your documents would be saved and you would just reinstall the operating system on top of the thing that you broke. Yes. And your stuff would come back and you would have that yeah. relief and that learning, like you say, having that in your back pocket. Things go wrong. I can always reformat and get a new computer here. Yeah. And I'll be back in business. Whereas people that don't do that, people that are afraid to break their computer are living in this constant fear that if they click the spray paint button in Photoshop, it's going to graffiti their whole computer. Like you don't know what's going to happen. You got to click these buttons. You got to find out what happens, I think. And then when something does go wrong, they don't have as much experience fixing it. And usually when something goes wrong in that situation, it's a bad time for it to go wrong, right? You're, you weren't intending it to go wrong. Whereas when you're kind of intentionally messing with it, you, you usually are doing that in a space where you have room to deal with the consequences. Um, there was a, a typing class I was in, in, I don't remember, middle school or high school. It was early high school or late middle school. And all of the computers had this program on it called, I think it was called Deep Freeze, something like that, or maybe exactly that. And essentially, no matter what you did to the computer, you could install programs, delete things, you know, no matter what you did to the computer, the next time it restarted, it was back to normal. It would just reset the entire computer every time it restarted. And that was their sort of their answer to these kids messing with the computers. Like, fine, do whatever you want. We won't put like restrictions in. But the next time the computer restarts, right back to normal. And I became obsessed with defeating that and and not learning how to type. So my typing, even today, it's still, it's not quite home row. I'll like do this and then I'll like kind of do this a little bit because I was not paying attention in that class. I spent the entire time trying to figure out how to break the deep freeze thing. I was obsessed with this, this damn deep freeze thing because it was really good. Um, it completely reset it. Anything you did, it would reset. And there was like no way around that. You know, you could, you could mess with the program as much as you want, but the next time we started, it was all back to normal. And finally, what I got to, I got to work was uh, one of those um, Windows recovery floppies, you know, where you boot up from the floppy and you get into the recovery mode. And um, it kind of, the program wasn't running yet in that recovery mode. So I could, in that recovery mode, I could break the program. I just like delete important files. But it took me a while to find like what to delete and what to change. And after that, like Deep Freeze wouldn't work on the computer anymore. And the, my computer wouldn't have Deep Freeze and then the computers next to it wouldn't have Deep Freeze because I'd hand the disk around. I wrote a bat, I was, oh yeah, I forgot this part. I wrote a, a bat script a batch script, all you do is put the floppy in and restart and it did everything for you. That's all it took. And I made like a bunch of these floppies and just hand them out. Um, but I'd given the people next to me. So like, there was like, oh, until, you know, there was like, you could maybe track back the radius to where the problem was coming from. Because all the computers around mine didn't have deep freeze on it. And every couple of months or weeks or whatever, um, I guess some poor IT tech uh, would have to go over there and like reset all the computers. Like, I don't know how these kids, you know, break in deep freeze. Uh, and then like a few days later, it'd all be broken again. So um, yeah, I probably made some IT guys life difficult, but I learned a lot in that process. I did, there was scripting, there was you know, recovery modes, command line. Uh, it was a very educational class Learned nothing about typing, but I learned a lot about computers. See, I don't know if you're lucky or not to have been uh, taught typing on a computer. I was taught typing on a typewriter and it was an electric, yeah. not a manual before people start yeah. aging me into the forties. <laughs> No, and, and it, you know, it was, it was fine. We learned to type. And it was funny because I, I used those skills immediately at home on uh, BBSs. Uh, BBSs, mm -hmm. bulletin board systems, you yeah. dial in. And if you're lucky, it would be a multi-line where they'd have maybe two lines or eight lines if you're really lucky. Mm -hmm. And a whole bunch of people could call in and they'd chat with you. And if you couldn't type, you couldn't chat. So I had a definite reason to learn how to type and I was learning how to type on the typewriter by day and going home and chatting with my buddies at night. And uh, it was just a great introduction to typing, but it seems like you got a lot more with scripting and breaking the program. <laughs> this is one, one little batch script, but I had to learn how to make the dang thing. Uh, but I was the same way with IRC as you just described a uh, bulletin board thing. I knew of bulletin boards, but uh, at that point I was already doing IRC communities. So was, that worked for me. There's also like use, a Usenet, but I never really got into that too much. But I found I found my people on IRC. Uh, that thing though, you're talking about the, the typing device. I kind of part of me kind of wishes I had that class because I would have actually learned how to type. I have friends who are the same age as me, uh, but it's just different school districts, different you know setups, and they had these little standalone devices. You know, where you all it was a computer, but all it did was type and it was a little screen 
and it told you what to type and you typed it. Um, and they're excellent typists. They're just like phenomenal typists. And I know you'd never too late to learn your skill, but um, I haven't figured that one out yet. I, I have Mario teaches typing somewhere because I remember playing that game. It was really fun. <laughs> the only skill that I think it's too late to learn is Dvorak typing. I think that would make yes. my mind explode. I think, I think the ship has sailed on Dvorak, sadly. So Travis, how did you go from messing with the computers in the lab and chatting on IRC to learning about Bitcoin? Did you computer, continue to use uh, computers in college or did you maybe go away from them and, and come back later? I uh, One of the things that I always really liked about Bitcoin was it was a very intersectional technology. Uh, people at events, they were there because they liked it. From, they were from a legal background or an economic background or like an ideological background or a political background, a computer science background. It is a very intersectional technology. It has impact in like social sciences as well as technology, um, economics, law, you know, it's just, it's, it's crazy. And for me, that was open source software because of Bitcoin's also open source. That's, that's the only reason why I'm here today. The only reason why I ever cared about Bitcoin was it was open source. Because the companies do things all the time. Um, they release great products and neat features and PayPal worked and there's all this great stuff you could use. But I wasn't going to go to a meetup event and volunteer my afternoon stacking chairs and answering questions and giving talks on Bitcoin 101 for, for PayPal, right? Um, but I was doing that already for open source projects. I already felt that sense of community with open source projects because like you're you're kind of an owner, you know, you're kind of a part of, of its creation. You know it's owned by the commons, you know, everyone has a piece of it. Um, it's not, you're not making uh Balmer or Gates, or whatever richer necessarily, you're, you're making everybody uses Linux richer. And at the time, it was like richer in experience. I know Bitcoin is like literally richer um, financially now. But I was doing a lot of Linux events. I was doing a lot of open source meetup groups where we would do install fests. People would bring their computers and we'd have a bunch of you know Linux uh, ISOs and install disks. And we'd help you set up Linux on your computer because that would, would take like three hours. And it was different for each computer. And you had to know all the drivers. And you had to know the different kinds of drivers. And um, you had to know different kinds of distros. And then there was like an hour of being taught how to use the computer after. So these, these Linux install tests were, were very involved. And I, I was doing those before I was doing Bitcoin Meetup. And I just kind of, then I went to a Bitcoin Meetup one day. And um, it got my attention the same way Linux had gotten my attention. I, I think that's a, a great way to come at it. Uh, because you have that early base of Linux where, uh, like you say, you didn't make any money for installing Linux on someone's computer. Mm -hmm. Like I, I talked mm -hmm. about the web all the time. I talked about BBSs. I like Linux too, all these things, but I never made any money for that. It was just something no. I did because I liked the internet. I was a part of the internet. I was a part of the BBSs. I wanted more people on there so they could enjoy what I enjoyed, playing the door games, reading the news, being able to look up my favorite actor and see what movie they were in that kind of stuff, yep. uh, the music reviews, all the early information on the internet is what drove me. And when I told people about it, I was like, hey, you know, you can get album reviews. You can find out that Pet Sounds is not a style of music. It's a Beach Boys album. Like, I didn't know that. I'm reading the book and they're like, mm -hmm. R.E.M. was heavily into Pet Sounds. I'm like, oh, Pet Sounds must be like a 60s kind of a chill groove of music. <laughs> and later on, I find out it's just a fantastic Beach Boys album. Um, but if you don't have the the click the hyperlinks, you don't have that knowledge right there. You're reading a book, you know, you don't have that additional knowledge. So, yeah, I wanted to share that. Uh, but you're right. It wasn't wasn't ever about getting rich with the Linux. And I don't think it was either for the early Bitcoin people. And that's why there's a lot of confusion right now where they're like, oh, you're an early Bitcoiner. You must be crazy rich. You must have sold your house and you must have done all these things and put everything into the new technology. And you're like, well, you know, I, I tried to put things in, but I also had to live and I also, you know, wanted to spend it to show people that it mm -hmm. worked and it was a thing. And, uh, and we're not deploying huge, we're not like inv investors or hedge fund people deploying massive capital at the new hot technology. It looks that way now that makes a lot of sense, but, and, it, and maybe it's hard also to hear that, oh, I was, we were interested in the internet and Linux and all this stuff that wasn't profit motivated because those are extremely well paying jobs now. Uh, startups are and being a software developer and an engineer and being into computers is a very profitable lifestyle, but not then. Um, it was it was something that was just really interesting. 
I say, uh, buy a Zeiss for now and follow the things you like. Because they might be, they'll probably be, if you like it, you're not special, right? It's hard to hear, but there are a lot of people like you. So if you like it, other people like it, they just don't, maybe don't know about it yet, or you haven't connected with them yet. And chances are there's going to be a large interest around this thing. Um, it's like the people who, who play like Minecraft on Twitch, right? Um, and they have, you know, 30 million followers and they, they make you know thousands of dollars a day and they get staff, they're sponsored and all this stuff that like, you, that's no way that's a job, but they they saw that it was a powerful medium. They saw it's a powerful platform. When they were starting out, they weren't making money. They didn't have these huge followings. This is a very kind of more new thing. You have all the things you love. I think that's the truth. You have to do what you want to do. And we used to have kind of different kind of people in computer science. And I kind of got washed out of computer science. They kind of chased me away. Uh, but at the same time, there were people that were in it because they wanted to make money. And they're like, I'm going to get the computer science job and I'm going to make this much. And that's sure. what my life's about. And then there were other people that were like me. They were just, I'm a natural computer person. I want to know everything about computers and I'm here to try out this programming. And if it works for me, it doesn't. And, you know, years later I came back to it and I was like, oh, I want to make a MySQL database. I want to make a PHP website. And I had no problem programming. It was simply when mm -hmm. it was random C stuff that I didn't understand what we were doing and why we were doing it it didn't click. But later on, when I saw more of like a kind of the way that I think they teach now with Java and PHP and other things where you actually, you know, build an application that works, a very small one, oh, that made so much more sense to me. Mm -hmm. And plus it just, it's more important because I, I always was going to learn it because I was always the computer person. I was always like in the computer camp doing the computer things. And I think it's better, like you say, to be in the thing that you believe in and to work in that thing. And that more mm -hmm. people need to follow that. Yeah, I mean, you're either you're either right and you're wrong, and this is obviously very easy to say um, in hindsight, right? But you're either right or you're wrong. It's something you love. Um, either other people will like it too, and it is some has some kind of future bigger than it is now, and it's going to be this amazing thing, or it's or it's not. And there there's a risk in that, but that risk exists with with uh, with everything. And the only place that risk doesn't exist is in really well established industries. Um, and if your interests are in those well-established industries, I mean, that, that's awesome. You know, you can just jump right into it. But, but a lot of times there's things you're interested in that are not well-established and a little bit harder to find. Now, you mentioned a Bitcoin meetup, and I think I mm -hmm. met you at a Bitcoin meetup. Uh, that's right. Bitcoin oh, I remember the day. Uh, in San Francisco. And uh, how, how did you get to find the meetup and uh, what did the meetup do? What, what was going on in San so, so, so viewers of, of Mad Bitcoins uh, probably already know uh, Mad Bitcoins is a very big deal in the uh, the early days of, of of Bitcoin. It was the show, the channel, and I remember when I met Mad Bitcoins, I was like, oh my gosh! I just had like a drink with the Mad Bitcoins. I had no idea he he, he lived around here. Um, it's the guy from the the internet, you know. It's the guy from the show that I watch every week. And that's was just the coolest thing. And I remember like the first time I like, went over to your house and we got like pizza or something. Like I hung out with Mad Bitcoins. Um, <laughs> I met you through the meetup group. That's right. Uh, the San Francisco Bitcoin meetup group. I would, I started off just going as we all did. It was a very long running group before the, the hosts had got it from the hosts before them. You know, it, it's, it's been handed down through the era of time going back, you know, to the distant past of Bitcoin, which is like 10 years ago or something. Um, <laughs> And I would just go and, 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 and listen. Uh, every Saturday, they had the Bitcoin 101 on Saturday at 20 Mission. And, and it was just, it just it was amazing to, to learn everything they had to say. They had the slides that they would you know, go through. And I remember like after like the third or fourth time I went, because um, before I, I was one asking questions. I'd be raising my hand asking questions. But the third or fourth one, people would be asking questions and I'd be answering them. And... I think it was like the fourth time or something afterwards we went and got burritos and we we're, and I just like, I'm going to get some to eat. I'm hungry. And like four people followed and we all just hung out at the burrito place and they just kept asking me questions about Bitcoin. And I realized like, I just learned, you know, I, I've only been to a couple of these and now I'm like the one who is dispensing the information. This is, this is a, a actually, there's a, definitely a learning curve. Uh, there's definitely some like weird jargon. It's definitely like different, but also it, it just makes a lot of sense. It's, it's very practical. Um, it's sort of like the way you'd expect the internet and money should work. And it's kind of more weird that it hasn't. Um, you know, like the when you go on the internet and you go to the wrong web page, you get that 404 page not found. 
those HTML, HTTP error codes, there are error codes for payment not found. They assumed when they were writing these all these error codes that there'd be some sort of native payment protocol, the same way there's a native communications protocol. And it was it's really more weird that there wasn't. Um, this is a harder problem than they realized at the time. And yeah, I really like those events. So I, I went to those events and then after a while I started um, hosting them. You know, I, I would be the one on the stage saying what Bitcoin was, um, stack chairs, help put coffee out, just, just doing grunt work. And um, Paige and Isabel were the hosts at the time. I, I believe, were you, were you a co-host then as well? Um, I, I was or did you become a host when I became a host, or a host organizer? Underneath them. But yeah, I would say the same yeah. thing where Bitcoin is very much a leaderless society. Like if you want to get mm -hmm. involved, you can start helping out. And pretty soon, like Travis said, you know, you'll be answering the questions. And, and yeah, no one my, came along and said, you you have the, you know, I knight you answerer of Bitcoin <laughs> questions or whatever. You took that. You didn't get knighted? Off. Oh man, I got knighted. Oh, you get knighted? No, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I, I is absolutely 100% correct. I was not a special person when I showed up. I, uh, the cool kids in Bitcoin were the programmers, you know, the ones actually like the, the oh, wow, it's a Bitcoin core dev showed up. My gosh, wow, it's Peter Wheel. Whoa, rock star, right? Um, or like that's Bram Cohen. He made BitTorrent, you know, like those were the cool kids. All I did was stack chairs and answer questions and ended up helping organize the meetup group. And it's kind of how open source systems work um, or have worked for a long time. I think how open source systems are, work is changing. Not they have access to actually like financial resources, but for the longest time, it's, it's a merit volunteer based ecosystem. It's whoever has the time and the space and the interest to stack chairs. And we're, we're seeing that on Clubhouse too. A lot of people are not, not famous. They're not PhDs or whatever. They don't have the background, but they've been trained up on what Bitcoin is and how to communicate it. Uh, especially I would say, and I say this all the time, shout out to the Black Bitcoin Billionaires group on Clubhouse. Lamar is doing incredible work there, teaching people and teaching them skills and then teaching them how to teach other people where they come out. And I'm like, wow, this guy's a you know, little Bitcoin fountain of knowledge. He, he's got really good background, good knowledge. Mm -hmm. He's polite to people. He's a good dude. Mm -hmm. I'm like, we need more of these. And Lamar is just is churning them out. He's making uh, Bitcoin and positive, you know, Bitcoin evangelists. So it's a really great time. I like that. Yeah. The education component is so important in an open source ecosystem. Um, Cause while, while Bitcoin and Ethereum and crypto, they have companies now that do exist and do marketing and PR and um, put a lot of money into that. Uh, early on, it was like Linux, you know, like, yeah, maybe there's Red Hat, right. Maybe there's a couple of companies, but for the most part, people learn about it by word of mouth. Uh, it's it's a volunteer movement. There's no multi-billion dollar PR company um, behind the message to explain to everyone what Linux is and how it works. It's just a lot of people who have to learn it and figure out for themselves. Uh, education is a really, really big, important component to uh, open source software. And Travis, what do you think about the future of Bitcoin? Where are we going mm -hmm. on this adventure? I heard a term that I actually really like uh, about what's happening with Bitcoin right now. I don't remember where I heard it. Um, but in a lot of, so like there's Bitcoin and there's Ethereum. Ethereum is is in a lot of ways getting a lot of attention because um, you, you, you can build on it, right? You can build a lot of things and you can build on Bitcoin as well, but Ethereum is just a little bit easier to build on. And so you got Ethereum building all the, the decentralized applications of things that everyone thought Bitcoin was going to do. And then you got Bitcoin uh, going after like regulators and uh, you know hedge funds and pension funds and ETFs, and that kind of feels like oh wait a minute like they're not they're not Bitcoin anymore and and I think uh, the thing I heard I really liked was like Bitcoin's working on the final boss. Um, I really like that term because like that means oh yeah no they're they're helping this is extremely useful. Someone's got to go to the regulator. Someone's got to go to the bank. Someone's got to go to the hedge funds and got to explain what it is, how it works, uh, help define the laws. They gotta they gotta like get the suits on board, right? Um, and Ethereum can't do that because Ethereum is still a work in progress. Uh, it's still beta software. It's still, you know, they're working on version two. It's this huge thing. Whereas Bitcoin, what it is, it's 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 done, right? From a technical perspective, I mean, people are building really cool layer two things, but it's like, this is what it is. You know, we can understand it. We can explain it. We can package it up. So I really like that 
the Bitcoin can now take on that final boss and go to them and be like, this is what it is. We can explain it to you. We can give you a half hour presentation. That's everything you need to know. And here's how it can be used. Here's how it's been used historically. Here are the things we've tried. Here are the things we are trying. And just make amazing progress in that like regulatory legal world. So I think that's the future of Bitcoin is getting an adoption in traditional finance around, you know, it's listed on the stock exchange, right? With an ETF. It's um, a part of every major company's uh, balance sheet, right? Like Tesla put like $1.5 billion into it or something. Um, not necessarily as an investment, but just as a, uh, a way of diversifying their cash. Companies do this all the time with, with assets like gold and stocks and everything. You just kind of diversify the balance or they'll have multiple different currencies because they're national companies. Um, I, I think I see a lot more companies doing that. I see a lot more pension funds doing it. I see a lot more hedge funds doing it. I see it being an option for more and more normal people as, a, as an investment, as a way of storing value. I and I don't think that's a revolutionary thought. I think that's pretty pretty obvious. Well, but I, I think that's a really good way of putting it, that Bitcoin is fighting the final boss. Um, yeah, that's not me. I didn't think of that up. I really like that, though. But, uh, I wish I could credit who said it. Are saying, saying things like, the, you know, uh, this is an interesting altcoin because of this, or that's an interesting altcoin because of that, or NFTs or ICOs or mm -hmm. different things are interesting. And I think they are. But the problem is we try to bundle them in with Bitcoin, like they're all part of the same thing, where Bitcoin has a specific purpose. It's been focusing mm -hmm. and training for this purpose for a long time, and it's going to go mm -hmm. do that purpose. And to me, that's one of the most important purposes in the world, uh, changing the way the central banks work, changing the way the money's printed. And especially we were talking about this a little bit earlier in a Twitter space today about the difference between capitalism and conservationalism. And that Bitcoin mm. is a big shift into conservationalism, despite all this energy FUD. The actual reality is that Bitcoin teaches you to save money, to think about your purchases, and not to buy new things unless you absolutely need them, which is what mm. conservationalism is, like trying to get more, you know, buy something that doesn't break, uh, repair the things that you own. That's a money-saving depression thought and all that. But it leads us into Bitcoin, and it might even be a positive thing where a lot of people are like, well, we need to switch. It's a limited, finite planet. We're ruining it. We need to switch our system. We're on a capitalist system. It needs growth uh, to grow. You know, we need growth to make yeah. money and profits. The religion of our time is growth. Exactly. And to reject that, you need a profoundly dis different system. And more and more as we talk about it, as, as Bitcoin prices get crazy, uh, everyone I know regrets selling anything. It feels horrible, all of that. We've all made horrible sales. Uh, but I think that's Bitcoin teaching us. I think that's it. You know, it's <laughs> lessons coming through that over and the long just, term. Yeah, people, the people got to live. I mean, as you were saying, like, uh, yeah, we were buying Bitcoin early on, but then like we go buy food and pay rent. And um, I'll see news articles just about the part where you said about regretting trades. I'll see a news article. It's like, you know, person has a flash drive with $300 million on it, but they don't remember the password. Right, that was one that recently there was like they have like a digi key or something uh, digi key is like an iron key and they have like three tries and they've tried twice um or five tries and they've tried three times and they have like a couple more tries and if you get the password wrong it wipes itself clean and and they always say like this he'd, he'd have 300 million dollars if you know his password but he wouldn't he would have he would have sold when it went from ten dollars to thirty dollars and have been like that's the greatest decision i ever made i can i can get that house i can get that car you know i can pay off my student loans um yeah, that that uh, actually just like keeping it as a long term retirement era investment. I mean, no one's done that yet. It hasn't been around long enough. Um, it, it's just it, it just require that shift in thinking around it. Yeah. And it, it's neat to see it start like uh, with the black Bitcoin billionaires. They have a thing where they're trying to make everyone a Satoshi millionaire. And a long time mm. ago, a Satoshi millionaire was nothing. But now that's like 600 bucks. Uh, even when they started, that was three hundred mm, million satoshis. Million satoshis. Um, yeah. So I, I think that I remember the twenty one club stuff. You remember the, the twenty one club stuff? Having to have twenty one bitcoins. <laughs> yeah, and there were different versions of it, right? Because fast, the yeah. twenty one club, there there can never be more than a million people in that, and there will be less because some went out there and have more than twenty one, or there's a bunch of bitcoins that are lost. So it's less than a million people could ever have twenty one. 
and there are you know more millionaires than that in the world and you know it's this whole this whole like little like early philosophy and that's just like it was a hard thing to do then it's a crazy thing to do now but there are other versions of it there's the 2.1 there's the 0.21 there's the 0.021 uh you can just kind of keep moving that decimal point and you just say it's a million people it's 10 million people it's 100 million people um I remember that stuff. I have a million Satoshis. I like even that. It's sort of the same world. A million Sats is good because it's low. But yeah, yeah. Even, even having yeah. one Bitcoin used to be kind of an achievable goal. And now mm -hmm. it's pretty much not achievable. As a working person, I, I've never had fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 at one Just time. Extra money laying around, yeah. yeah. That's totally absurd. That's, um, that's why I like the dollar cost averaging. Um, yeah, you can buy I was something I was telling. Exactly. I tell people this at the meetup groups. They're like, when do I buy Bitcoin? I'm like, I don't know um there's no way to know when a good time to buy is so you just like if you if there's like you want to buy a thousand dollars worth of bitcoin at some point uh don't like wait for the perfect moment to buy that thousand dollars buy a hundred dollars ten times right like once a, once a month put a hundred dollars in and then after 10 months the, the price you bought at was that average price and it'll probably be a pretty okay price the other the other trick is not to look at it Everyone yeah. puts a hundred bucks in and they start checking the price every day, three times a day. Yeah. Oh my gosh, look at the phone. Oh my. And that wasn't your life before. Un unless you're a stockbroker, your trader type, you're yeah. not checking mm -hmm. the thing this much. You don't need to know. It's just like mm -hmm. with news in politics. Certain times I get overloaded and I'm like, okay, I don't really, you know, I don't vote in the Senate. I'm not really important or anything. I don't need to know this much. I could take some time back <laughs> and not know everything about like Trump or what he's doing or whatever. So yeah. especially like the, there's the price up version of that, right? It goes up and you're like, oh my God, I better sell. But when it goes down, people, that's a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. But, but if the thing you liked about it hasn't changed, um, then nothing has changed, right? Like it, you still believe it is of value to the world. Um, it's just the market has like weird cycles and it does crazy things and no one knows why it does what it does. Uh, the more you understand about the stock or the coin or whatever the asset is, the more you understand it, the less the price swings uh, matter because you know, like, oh, but nothing, I know nothing has changed. Like I, I'm paying attention to the news. The price didn't drop because somebody found you could steal everyone's Bitcoin or something. Um, I know it's just down because of some some BS or because like the economy or whatever. So the less you pay attention to the price, the more pay, you pay attention to how it works, what it is, what's happening in the space. And uh, Travis, what are you working on now? Where can people check out your work? I recently uh, switched over to being a software developer, finally, it's something I was always interested in, but I did the more IT side, system administrator, and uh, a couple of years back, I quit that job and went to a boot camp and learned how to be a programmer. And I worked for about a year and a half at a software consulting firm. I just left that job because I wanted to focus more on Web3 development. So that's when MetaMask connects to your web page. You know, like you go to a site and it's like, please connect your MetaMask wallet. That's Web3. That's one version of it. There's lots of different versions of it. And I was planning on spending all my time on that. But I, I, left, I had my last day of work. And I'd given my notice like three weeks before, you know, I didn't, I had no idea this was happening. I left my job and the very next day, like my DMs blow up because something you and I worked on four years ago, that was a fun thing at the time, but kind of failed in a lot of ways to gain any kind of traction. It was something we were very proud of, but like no one else really cared about it. It's suddenly extremely historically significant to Ethereum. Uh, that was Curio Cards, which was the first art NFT on Ethereum. There were there was that game um, before that. So they have the first NFT title. Ethereum cards was the first art NFT. I've never really been comfortable saying that the first because I always figured someone's gonna be like, actually, uh, we came out a day before you. Um, but at this point, people have been pouring over this so much. They didn't find Curio because they looked at Curio and said, is this the first one? They went looking for the first one and they found Curio. And I've never done that direction of the research before. So it makes me feel really confident that they're they're probably right. So I spent the last couple of weeks essentially getting this old thing out of the closet and dusting it off and trying to, with the help of a lot of people, trying to get it compatible with modern, you know, anything. 
Uh, we didn't have MetaMask. You know, we didn't have Uniswap. We didn't have OpenSea. We didn't have any of that, that junk when we made this thing. It's not compatible with anything. It's not an NFT token standard. There were no NFT token standards. That's the point. We arguably inspired those standards, but we're not compatible with them. So there's been a lot of work around a wrapper, uh, which you can take your old curio cards and essentially put them inside of another token that is a modern standard that is compatible with OpenSea. So you can buy and sell them on OpenSea now. We had to make we made a really cool wrapper website where you can bulk wrap your cards and bulk unwrap your cards. And, There's and people a, can people can check that out at curio. Dot card. Right. We're getting to dot ahead card. of ourselves here, but yes, it sounds yeah. like quite a lot happened to you, Travis. So yeah, it's been a busy couple of weeks. Uh, part two to this interview. That's right. All right. Thank, thanks so much, Travis, for being on the show. It was great learning about your first computer and talking about the early days of IRC. I didn't know we'd go there <laughs> and it was super <laughs> fun, uh, to go on that trip mm -hmm. together. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tom.